What is going on guys, my name is John and welcome back to yet another video. Experience. It's probably the most important aspect of Pokemon. Use it to make your Pokemon stronger, more defensive, learn moves from leveling up, and most importantly evolve so you can catch them all. But what would happen if you couldn't earn any experience throughout the entire game? Today we're going to find out how easy you can beat Pokemon Platinum without earning any experience. Now you're probably very confused as to how exactly something like this can be done in the first place, and I'm actually using a modified version of Pokemon Platinum in order to make this work. Essentially, whenever we knock out a Pokemon in either a trainer or a wild battle, the game will replace whatever experience we earned with the number zero, resulting in the battle completing without giving any experience. This means that the Pokemon that we catch in the wild will always be at the same level, and the only way they can get a stronger team is if we replace it with an entirely different Pokemon. In addition to this concept, there are additional rules that I threw in to truly make the challenge as experienceless as possible. Although you can earn EXP through the daycare centers, we're going to completely ignore using them. I mean, we could just bike around until we're level 100, so it's pretty obvious that doing this would make the challenge unbelievably easy. So that area is completely off limits. In addition, rare candies are also not going to be allowed. Because you need experience to get from one level to the next, technically this gives you experience, so I figured that I should include this as well just to ensure that there is literally no way that we can even get one experience point through the entire challenge. The final big rule is that no items can be used in battle. This is pretty much the standard for challenges now, but it's still important to note regardless. This whole entire challenge was streamed live on my Twitch channel, and if you're interested in seeing me do more things like that, I stream about 5-6 to six days a week, so I'd really appreciate it if you checked it out. Before we get into the challenge, be sure to leave a like and subscribe so you never miss an upload. These videos take a ton of effort to put together, and this is the best way that you can show support, and you can always unsubscribe if you change your mind down the road. With all that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. So the game starts out as it normally does, with talking to our mom and Barry, and right from the get-go we have to make a decision that may not seem too important right now, but it can have a large impact on our experience throughout the entire challenge. Per usual, I let my chat pick the starter, and they decide on Piplup, which may seem like a solid choice because our first challenge is going to be taking on Rourke, but since none of our starters know any stab moves at level 5, they're all equally kind of useless. Our first battle against Barry went very poorly because he spammed withdraw until we were only dealing about 1 HP of damage per turn, so we ended up losing the very first battle. Thankfully this doesn't matter too much because we don't need the experience anyways, but this was definitely foreshadowing as how the rest of the challenge would probably play out. If you've never watched my streams, my luck with RNG and Pokemon is probably the worst out there. Granted, I'm kinda small brain with a lot of the decisions I make, but you'll see later on some of the ridiculous things that I encounter. After going through some of the initial storyline events, we went to Route 202 to catch some of the first members that we'll sacrifice to the Sinnoh region. The first member is going to be Shinx, who is basically just as strong as Piplup, however it does have the ability to intimidate which can make a huge difference, especially this early in the game. To get a taste as to how much we're going to have to build our team, I decided to take on the first trainer. For some reason, I gained experience in this battle even though I literally showed my chat two minutes prior that I didn't earn any experience from wild battles, so I had to reset to fix that. Thankfully I saved right after the rival fight, but on the second attempt it worked perfectly fine so I'm not exactly sure what happened here but it was the only time that we ever encountered that issue. To my surprise, the first few battles were significantly easier than I thought they'd be. I ended up grabbing a Shinx again, as well as Starly, who took the lead of most of the battles leading up to Jubilife City. As you know, the next big task is our second rival battle to the east of the city, and while I think I could probably manage with the team of six, I decided to hunt for a couple more higher level Pokemon that'll last longer than only a couple of battles. Route 204's encounters are generally pretty much the same level as our current team, but the Ravage Path contains Pokemon as high as level 6. Big difference, I know. After a couple minutes, I was able to have Zubat to the team, who is hopefully a great wall for Turtwig, but I also grabbed two more Starly to have a full team advantage. The second battle against Barry wasn't all that difficult because he only has two Pokemon, but considering that Turtwig is nearly double our level made this a little daunting. Thankfully, Zubat worked exactly how I wanted it to, so we were able to make it through without any major hiccups. After skipping every trainer in our path, we somehow made it to Orberg City and are free to progress towards getting our very first gym badge. As you can assume with our current team of birds and bats, Rock-type Pokemon are literally the worst weakness you could possibly have, so after a single battle, we're ready to create a completely new team. If you played this game before, the first obvious thought is to go north of the city and catch Machop because it has access to Low Kick, so I grabbed one of those before heading south to the mine. On our way to meeting up with Rourke, I managed to catch a Geodude before heading back to give our first go at the gym. In all honesty, with a mix of having Rock Smash and Low Kick on Machop, I figured that this gym wouldn't really be that difficult, but after finding out that Kranidos one-shots Machop, I realized that this probably won't be all too smooth sailing. During this very quick battle, I noticed that Geodude and Onyx didn't really have anything to counter my own Geodude with Rock Smash, and considering that Kranidos' main moves are Headbutt and Pursuit, there is a small chance that I could actually pull through and win. 
After running through the Orberg mine for about 15 minutes, I managed to build a team of powerful dudes ready for any rock type to cross their path. Because his entire team didn't have any rock or ground type moves, my team actually walled literally everything except Krandos' pursuit. Although nearly my entire team was knocked out by the end, I was able to take down Rourke on my second try to claim our first badge. Upon heading back to Jubilife City, we have our first real encounter with Team Galactic through the double battle at the edge of the city. Our rivals Chimchar basically carried that battle, so it wasn't all too bad, but the next Pokemon that we have to face is our most difficult opponent yet. One Pokemon so strong that every trainer in the region shudders at its sheer power. Badoo. Now although the dude squad was super helpful, Badoo nearly one-shots every Geodude, and Machop deals basically no damage because fighting moves are resisted. While the obvious play is to replace our team with another group of Pokemon, the issue here is that there really isn't anything available. Ponyta is available near Orberg, but the issue is that it doesn't know any fire type moves, so we're going to have to work with what we got. I ended up bringing back the Zubat that we caught earlier because it walls our team, but even that deals more damage to us than we do to it. As much as I hate to admit it, this one Pokemon is harder than the entire Rourke fight, but after a few attempts I managed to get to hit self in confusion to death, so thankfully we can just- You've gotta be kidding me. Thankfully this bundle of cherries only used growth and tackle, rather than leech seed, so after a painful 20 minutes we can finally move on. Our next stop is Floroma Town, and overall the events here went pretty smoothly with dealing with the grunts in the meadow, to making our way over to Valley Windworks to investigate the building. Although the grunts here also don't pose any difficulty, we have our first battle against Commander Mars, who is already known for being pretty annoying in just a regular playthrough. In this battle she only has two Pokemon, and Zubat obviously is very easy to take down aside from having to worry about Toxic, but her ace Perugly is a thing of nightmares. Not only is this fat cat over double our level, but it's also fully evolved, so it was very obvious that we're going to need to plan ahead to get the best Pokemon available in this new area. After running in the grass, I managed to catch Weasel, Shinx, and Shellos to help, and it's important to note that Shinx has access to Intimidate, which is arguably the greatest issue that we have with her Perugly. With our new team, it was definitely much easier to work with, but this is a prime example of how bad my luck is. During all the attempts, Perugly landed minimum 2 critical hits per fight, which obviously one-shots anything on my team. With the Pokemon that you're able to collect at this point, the only true way to take down Perugly is to lead with Shinx to activate Intimidate to lower its attack, and then use Rock Smash on Geodude and hope that you lower its defense enough to deal a ton of damage. This battle took an hour to win, and honestly I don't think there was any other option that we had. I ended up getting 4 defense drops in one battle to secure the win, and this concluded the first day of streaming. Overall we made a ton of progress, but there is still much more that needs to be done. Now that all the events are taken care of in this area, the only real obstacle that we have to address is the Eterna Forest. As most of you know, this area doesn't really have a lot of mandatory battles, however they are double battles which could either make it very easy or an absolute nightmare. Before we do that, on the previous day I slathered honey on the tree, and we thought that maybe something like Heracross would come in clutch a little bit later in the game, but we obviously ended up with a Wurmple, so let's just move along. Within the Eterna Forest we meet Cheryl, and we have to bring her to the end, and with our current team I decided to just give the first trainer battle a shot. To no surprise, we got absolutely destroyed by a Pachirisu and a Beauty Fly, so I took some time to run through the grass to collect a few more members for the team. Out of all the options, Ghastly was a great option because it has access to Curse, and conveniently we can catch our own Beauty Fly, which is the highest level encounter that we can get at the moment. These two Pokemon basically carried my team throughout the two double battles here, and thankfully once we reach the exit of the forest, we're able to grab a couple more Pokemon that we'll definitely need to handle the next gym leader. Once we reach Eterna City, we have a few more story events before we're able to head east to find some higher level encounters. On Route 211, there are actually quite a few strong choices, but I chose to catch Metatite, Machop, and Bronzor before heading into Cave to catch a higher level Zubat. This team combined with Beautyfly and Ghastly seemed like it was the best option, with the only thing that would probably make it easier would be catching more Beautyfly. At first glance, it seems like Gardenia's Gym is going to be one of the harder fights that we're going to take on, solely off of our lack of any strong moves, but thankfully because Beautyfly has access to Gust, all the trainer battles in this section were pretty easy, but Gardenia's team is obviously much more difficult to manage. Her first Pokemon is Turtwig, who isn't all too difficult to take down, however it's used to set up for her next Pokemon, Cherum. This Pokemon basically walls my entire team, so by the time I do knock it out, Gardenia can sweep with Rose Raid, who was the actual issue with this battle. After a few attempts, I found out it was best to leave with Beautyfly and hope that it doesn't deal too much damage before Cherim is sent out. Leech Seed and Magical Leaf are probably our biggest weaknesses here, but it almost always goes for Safeguard turn 1, which means that we're pretty much free to go for at least one move before it starts giving us issues. Although I had originally planned it for Roserade, it seems like Ghastly was the best choice because I could set up Curse to combat Leech Seed and Poison Heals, and after some trial and error, we were able to get to Roserade no problem. The issue with this is that this Pokemon is very powerful compared to our team, so by the time Cherim is out of the picture, we're too weak to finish it off. After a lucky matchup against Turtwig, I used Curse on Ghastly and immediately switched it out from a chop to preserve the rest of its health. I sent out Beautyfly again and knocked it out with Gust, which gives us 5 Pokemon that we can work with to take this thing down. 
Because Ghastly is outsped, I chose to use Bronzor to put sleep and hope that it doesn't wake up on the second turn to ruin my team. Upon switching, she of course did exactly that, so I just assumed that I had lost at this point. I sent out Beautyfly, and with a stroke of luck, I managed to get a crit on the last hit to win the battle. Although I got super lucky here, I honestly think that the previous strategy would have worked perfectly fine, but hey, a win's a win. Before we leave Eterna, we have one last big fight that we have to take care of. At the top of the Galactic Building, we have to take on Commander Jupiter. Now you're probably thinking that this is going to be just as nightmarish as Mars, but thankfully this one only took a few tries. After losing to her Skun Tank on the first try, I realized that we can catch Geodude east of here, and they all know Magnitude. After catching one, I brought it back to the fight, as well as a few Shanks to lay down a few Intimidates. I ended up getting decent rolls on Magnitude to knock it out, but it did also miss Poison Gas twice, so this battle definitely could have been much, much more annoying. After collecting the bike, the next gym that we had to head for is in Hardhome City, and not only can we get some stronger Pokemon along the way, but there is one specific Pokemon that will make this challenge a whole lot easier. Gibble. If we head under the bridge and go into the secret section of the Wayward Cave, we can encounter Gibble from level 17 to level 20, and every single one that we find will have access to the move Dragon Rage. This move always deals 40 HP of damage, which is over 50% of any Pokemon's health that we're going to encounter at this point in the game. Naturally, I spent 30 minutes here catching 5 of them, as well as another Bronze Ore that I found along the way. As you can expect, this made all the battles of the city insanely easy to do. Set damage moves are a godsend this early in the game, and I figured this would make getting the batch from Fantina a piece of cake. Once we reach Hardhome City, we're able to immediately challenge the gym, and thankfully we can avoid all the trainers and take her head on. Her team consists of Duskull, Haunter, and Miss Magius, who are all great threats for their own reasons. Gibble can almost one-shot Duskull, which is really good because of the fact that it wastes a heal later for Miss Magius, but Haunter was pretty annoying due to Shadow Claw dealing about 75% of my health. After a few attempts, I was able to fight Miss Magius, and I found that it completely destroys every Pokemon on my team in one hit. It's without question that Gibble is the best Pokemon that you can catch up to this gym, so it seemed like this was the end of the challenge. Sure, there are probably some Pokemon that we could grab that have access to Bite, but realistically there isn't anything that can survive a Shadow Ball from Miss Magius at this level. After thinking it over with my chat, we found that the Gift Eevee from Bebe would be a better addition than the Bronze Ore because of the fact that it completely walls Haunter. The only moves that it can land are Confuse Ray and Hypnosis, so the worst thing that can happen is that we hit ourselves in Confusion. In addition, all of my Gibble have the ability Sandville, which gives us plus one evasion while we're in a Sandstorm. Conveniently, all of my Pokemon know that move already, so if we set it up before we take down Haunter, there's a good chance that it could work out in our favor. As you can see, this means that the entire battle is determined on if Miss Magius misses Shadow Ball on all of our Pokemon once, which may not seem like a big deal, but I'd like to mention once again that my luck isn't the best in the world. There was one time that I brought a Haunter down to minus 6 evasion with Sand Attack, switched to Gibble, and it still landed Confuse Ray, Hypnosis, and then a Crit Shadow Claw all in succession. I have no idea what the chances are of that to happen, but after over an hour of attempts, I ended the night pretty much clueless as to how we're going to get through this without having to completely rely on luck. On the third day, we came back with really only one idea that would actually benefit us, that being the Quick Claw. This gives us a 20% chance each turn to move first, which was really the greatest issue we were having with this battle. Shadow Ball was still the killer of every attempt, but if we can have one more Gibble to attempt Dragon Rage after Haunter is down, I'm down to give it a go. On the first attempt of the day, I completely forgot to set up Sandstorm against Haunter, and realized that I completely threw what seemed to be a decent attempt. I swapped into the Quick Claw Gibble, and believe it or not, it worked first try for Sandstorm. It missed this next Shadow Ball, however it landed the next three in a row. Now, this may sound bad, but this is actually the best chance I had to win. During each turn, it was taking Sandstorm damage, and if it didn't, its health would have been low enough to heal, and thankfully it missed Shadow Ball on the perfect turn for Dragon Rage to knock it out without Sandstorm. Although this is by far our hardest gym yet, I find it hilarious that the only thing that saved this battle was the item that we went out of our way to grab. Now that we've collected three badges, we can head east of Hardhome, and we're immediately thrown into another battle. I was so excited that I beat Fantina that I completely forgot to heal, but on the second attempt, the Gibble Squad was back to his true form and completely ran through my rival's team. Moving forward quite a bit, the routes leading up to Vealstone City were honestly pretty easy considering that you can avoid basically every trainer battle for three routes, but the dumb battle right at the gate obviously gave us the most trouble. I still won on the first try, but the fact that we had to deal with Toxic Spikes for nearly the whole battle resulted in me winning with only one HP left. Now that we're in Vealstone City, it's time to take on the fourth gym leader. Maylene's gym is focused around fighting type Pokemon, and although we don't have any direct counters with our current team, Dragon Rage is still really strong, so our only true concern is if our Pokemon can actually survive a hit. Surprisingly, the team was able to take down all the trainers with no problem, but when it came time to take on Maylene, it was a completely different story. Her lead is Metatite, and Drain Punch one-shots every Gibble on my team, so although they can still be useful in this battle, it's probably just best to rebuild my team to grab some higher level encounters. Thankfully, if we head south of the city, we can access one area that has some fantastic counters to her team. 
Route 214's encounters are all weak to fighting. However, we head south to the Valor Lakefront, we can encounter both Staravia and Girafferig to take on our team. Both of these Pokemon range from level 26 to 28, so not only will our team be at a much higher level, but they both get stab super effective moves. Girafferig will always have Psy Beam, and Staravia will have Wing Attack, but the level 28's have Aerial Ace as well. This isn't really a big deal because they're both 60 base power, but if we're in a situation with lowered accuracy, we can use that to our advantage. After catching a full team of them, we head back to the gym and take on Maylene. As you can imagine, this made this so much easier, but I guess luck was on my side as well for the battle. For some reason, when Lucario was brought down to red health, he didn't get healed, so I was able to beat that and run through the rest of her team. In this battle, she only used one heal when she has access to two, so there was a good potential this would have been pretty difficult if this didn't happen. Now let's make our way to the next gym. After having our rivals Clefairy explode on our team, we can collect the HM for Fly and head south again until we reach Pastoria City. For a mile away, I could tell that taking on Crasher Wake was going to be a nightmare because of the level gap, as well as the fact that he leads with the Gyarados. Although our team worked really well for the last gym, it's time to once again build a completely new team. Thankfully, Pastoria has the Great Marsh, so there are a couple Pokemon that could potentially be really useful. After running around for a bit, I managed to catch a Tangela and Tropius. While I was grabbing them, I realized that Floatzel also has Ice Fang, which makes both of them pretty useless. So we're definitely going to need something else in order to have even a little bit of a chance. At this point, I genuinely thought the challenge was over because there was literally nothing in the vicinity of this area that has a counter to his team, but my chat suggested that maybe one Pokemon could help. Pikachu. Pikachu can be found within the Trophy Garden on Route 212, and this is the only Electric-type Pokemon that's close to Crasher Wake's team. And even that is kind of a reach. After catching a team of them, I wasn't very confident considering that a Gyarados could easily knock out any Pikachu in one hit, so the only option that we had was to evolve one of them with a Thunderstone and hope that Raichu can handle at least one Pokemon. One big issue with these Pikachu is the fact that no matter what level you catch them at, they don't know any Electric-type damaging moves. The closest you can get is Thunderbolt at level 26, but the max level they can be found at is level 24, so the only option was to go to the Vealstone department store and teach all of them Thunder. While this is a great move, this means that every time we attack, there's a 30% chance that it won't even land. After evolving Pikachu to Raichu, I accidentally ran to the battle against Barry in front of the gym. Despite being completely unprepared, I still managed to beat him on the first try, which gave me a little hope this gym wouldn't be too bad. When it came time to face the trainers in the gym, I was actually surprised as to how well Raichu handled all the battles. It nearly one-shot everything, so I knew that I definitely had the strength to beat the leader, I just needed to hope that I landed all the moves when I needed to. Crasher Wake's team consists of Gyarados, Quagsire, and Floatzel. Gyarados was by far the biggest issue because of the fact that it outspeeds and deals an absurd amount of damage to everything on the team. After a few failed attempts, I decided to give Raichu the Quick Claw and only do attempts if I'm able to land a Thunder first. This wasn't too big of a deal considering that's a guaranteed knockout, and it's also the first turn of the match, so I'm not spending a ton of time resetting. After defeating Gyarados, it became glaringly obvious that Floatzel was way more of an issue than that. Not only does Ice Fang deal a lot of damage, but Priority Aqua Jet one-shots all the Pikachu on my team, which means that Raichu is literally the only Pokemon that can take it down. Thunder doesn't deal enough damage to knock it out, and Crunch brings Raichu down to like 1 HP. With this in mind, the only thing I figured I could try and do is get Static and Intimidate with my team. I switched into Staravia and then immediately switched into Pikachu for the 30% chance of Static. Once that Pokemon is knocked out, I'll repeat the process until only Raichu and Staravia is left. From here, you just pray that either Thunder crits or you land them before it knocks you out. As you can tell, every attempt is basically a complete shot in the dark, as the entirety of this match is based around RNG. While I was doing the switching technique, I managed to get a Static off on the first Pikachu to have its speed. After giving it a little chip damage from Tropius, Raichu landed the first Thunder to secure the victory. In total, this battle took about 45 minutes to beat, but up until this point, this challenge was by far the most creative method that we've come up with. After confronting the Grunt at Valor Lakefront, Cynthia gives us the secret potion to use in the Psyduck blocking Route 210. Once we clear them out, we can advance north of Celestic Town to take care of a few more story-related events. The trainers on these routes are significantly higher level than my current team, so I spend a little time grabbing a Scyther for some light backup before taking on the routes leading to the town. Within Celestic Town, there aren't many things that need to be done other than have a battle with Cyrus in the cave, so I took a bit more time to grab some new members to make it just a little bit easier. If you go to Route 211, we can catch Machoke and Graveler, which are much more useful than you think. All of the Graveler here have access to Self-Destruct, which can be extremely helpful when taking down any of those tanky Pokémon that have been giving us so much trouble. That being said, even without these Pokémon, the Cyrus battle would have probably been a breeze. The only real issue here is Sneasel because of our flying coverage, but Machoke completely destroys it with revenge, so I did this on my first attempt. If we follow the storyline, Byron's team is the next big wall, and considering that basically only Machoke can help here, it's pretty obvious that we're going to need an entirely new team again. After previewing Byron's team, we realize that the best play would be to catch Gastrodon in the water in Route 205. 
Having a water and ground stab basically runs through his entire team, so it's by far the smartest option out of what we have. After surfing around for a bit, we grabbed our first one at level 31, but later on I managed to encounter one at level 39. The highest level you can find them at is level 40, so this is nearly the highest level Pokemon we can possibly encounter at this point in the game. After securing that on the team, we made our way to the Fuego Ironworks to catch two Magmar, and I bought the TM for Fire Blast for each of them. We do also have the ability to get the TM for Flamethrower, but I decided to try and save that for more important sections later on in the challenge. Once we reach Candlelave City, we have another battle with our rival on the bridge. Although it seemed like a battle against Barry would be a nightmare, having Gastrodon made such an enormous difference because it was the only Pokemon at the same level as the rest of his team. Magmar took out Torterra without any issues, and even Graveler managed to beat Staraptor without even having to do self-destruct. Overall, this took three tries to win, which is kind of shocking considering that we're getting to the point where, aside from Gastrodon, we're extremely underleveled in every match that we go into. From here, I took a quick stop at Iron Island to grab the HM for strength, as well as catch the new Graveler to replace the current ones on our team. They're not much higher level, but it's always a benefit to have a higher level Pokemon on the team. To make it short, the trainers in Byron's gym were destroyed by literally everything on my team. Byron's team didn't really pose any threat or counter, and I managed to get through it on my first try. Although it may seem like my crutch is Gastrodon, Magmar actually did most of the work, so even being 10 levels under doesn't really give us any difficulty. After meeting with the gang at the Candlelave Library, we all branch off towards our respective lakes to take on the Galactic Commanders. Overall, the first two battles were pretty easy because they only have three Pokemon that you have to deal with, and you're also able to avoid basically every grunt on the way there to make things a lot more simple. There isn't really much to say because it was so easy, but now is the time where we start facing off against some real threats in the story. Because the last lake is all the way up at the top of the map, we're going to venture through Mount Coronet in order to make our way there. After exiting at the top, we reach Route 216 and make our way up to Snowpoint City. This is when the levels start to get concerningly high for trainer battles, but somehow my team still managed to make it through all the mandatory battles. I almost lost to literally the last trainer, but they threw on the last turn and I won with only 4 HP on my Graveler. I also made sure to grab the HM for Rock Climb on the way up, but overall I was very surprised as to how well my team was able to handle the battles. After reaching Snowpoint City, I immediately went to challenge Candace. The trainers in the gym were a little tough, but it actually helped me plan a little because I was able to one-shot Sneasel with Self-Destruct, which is a big deal because she leads with the same Pokemon when we take her on. Candace's team consists of Sneasel, Piloswine, Abomasnow, and Frostlass. Out of all the Pokemon, the only real issue that we had to deal with is Frostlass. Abomasnow's ability sets up Snow Warning for the rest of the battle, which means that Frostlass will be able to take advantage of Snow Cloak for evasion, plus it can also just use Double Team to make it nearly impossible to hit her. This battle took a ton of trial and error by testing if using Rain Dance would be effective, but it ended up hurting the team because Magmar's Fire Blast was weakened, and Piloswine outspeeds Gastrodon anyway, so it would just keep sending up hail right before it got knocked out to make things a lot more frustrating. After a while, the meta became just a Pray and Hope Fire Blast landed through evasion, which resulted in quite a few resets. Magmar couldn't knock it out in one hit, so between the two Magmar that I had, I had to make sure they both landed their moves to win. After many attempts, Frostlass ended up getting a crit Shadow Ball and a crit Blizzard on Magmar and Gastrodon, so I ended up having a 1v1 against her Frostlass with my other Magmar. It was slightly damaged when I used Faint Attack with Magmar, and thankfully I was able to land a final hit to secure the 7th badge. Now that we've taken care of all this, it's time to take on the climax of the story. Once we head to Lake Acuity and meet up with our rival and Commander Juniper, we're able to head to Vealstone City to go through the Galactic Building. After quickly climbing through the floors, we reach Cyrus. This battle is almost the same battle as the one that we did in Celestic Town, so I applied roughly the same strategy and took care of him on my first try. After this battle, we obviously get the Master Ball, which will come into pretty good use later on, no matter what we decide to use it on. The only other battle that we have to take on is the one against Commander Saturn. The real threat here is Toxicroak because of Poison Jab, but thankfully Graveler was able to tank a hit and use Self Destruct to finish off this section of the challenge. From here, everyone is heading to the Spear Pillar, but since the battles we're going to face are going to be extremely high level compared to us, I think it's time to grab another group of encounters. Out of all the locations currently available, to no surprise Mount Coronet is the best place to find high level encounters. Basically every Pokemon that you can find near the summit is really good, so I basically caught everything to make sure that I had coverage for every battle. Here I caught Metacham, Abomasnow, Golbat, Graveler, Bronzong, and Absol. Out of all the Pokemon on my team before this, I obviously kept Gastrodon because of its coverage and the fact that it's still at the same level as the rest of my recent catches. We ended up leaving Metacham behind, and I spent some time at the Vealstone department store buying TMs to ensure that we're prepared for literally any grunt that crosses our path. As you can tell, our team isn't exactly the most diverse team out there, but these are literally the best encounters that we're going to have at this point, so we're going to have to work with what we've got. As we're progressing to the top of Mount Coronet, there are quite a few battles that have to be taken on, but overall they weren't too difficult aside from a couple specific Pokemon. Out of all the sections of the game, I fear that this would be the second and most difficult section, so let's just jump into the biggest battles in the Galactic storyline.
The first battle of the Spear Pillar is a double battle with two grunts keeping guard, and this one isn't even slightly difficult. All their Pokemon aren't even evolved, so we can quickly move to a battle that I wasn't really too sure how it would go. Right before we confront Cyrus, we have another double battle against the two commanders, but thankfully our rival will help us get through it. Although Barry's team is really strong, the fact that he always leaves with Munchlax means that we're basically in a 1v2, with the chance that it might rarely go for Body Slam. I ended up leading with Gastrodon and was able to wipe out half of their team before I was knocked out. For some reason they were prioritizing Barry's team, so thankfully I was able to clean up this battle with the rest of my team to finish off this part. After this battle, Cyrus summons Dialga and Palkia, and Giratina appears to suck him into the distortion world. Naturally, we follow after him and make our way through the puzzles and vertical waterfalls with Cynthia, before catching up with him at the end. Now, if you watch this live, you're probably already having horrible flashbacks, so I apologize in advance. At this point, I was pretty confident that our team could beat Cyrus, but I was also well aware that this is going to be easily one of the hardest battles in the game. Cyrus's team consists of Houndoom, Honchcrow, Crobat, Gyarados, and Weavile. I kinda went into this battle without a plan, which to be transparent was a majority of this challenge, but nothing could have prepared me for how absurdly difficult this battle really is. To start out, Houndoom deals massive damage to literally everything on my team. It can take out Graveler, Bronzong, Abomasnow, and Golbat in one shot, which means that I have an extremely limited option to start the battle. I chose to lead with Gastrodon, who walls it relatively well, but in 95% of these scenarios, Gastrodon is completely useless by the end of it from either being burned or brought down to like 20 HP. The next Pokemon that he sends out is Gyarados. Now if we look back at our encounter with Crash Awake, you know that Thunder deals a ton of damage, and thankfully Absol has that ready for him. The issue is the fact that Absol only deals about half damage, and Waterfall is a ranged knockout. Most of the time we'll live on less than 10 HP, but there are many more factors that influence this one matchup. Not only is Thunder only 70% accurate, but Waterfall also has a chance to flinch, and if you watch this live, you'd understand how unbelievably terrible my luck was. A majority of my initial resets for this battle were solely just from Absol missing Thunder, and if I didn't miss it, it was because I was either flinched or crit. I honestly don't think I've ever had worse luck in the history of playing Pokemon than I did with this one stream, but after about 20 resets, I managed to take down Gyarados with a crit. From here, he sends out Weavile. At the time, I knew that Weavile was going to be the biggest problem, but after spending so much time with Gyarados, I realized that I either needed a new strategy, or the challenge was just straight up impossible with our current team. Weavile obviously outspeeds everything on our team, and since it also knows Night Slash, Ice Punch, Fake Out, and X Scissor, it covers literally every single Pokemon on my team aside from Gastrodon, who we have to use on Houndoom to even make it up to this point. During the stream when we first challenged him, I streamed for over 4 hours trying to beat him. 4 hours! Now keep in mind I'm well aware that I could go back and replace my Pokemon, but I knew deep down this team had the ability to win. I ended up so close to winning one time, but I made one bad move and completely threw the battle. Knowing that this team could actually win made me even more stubborn because I wanted to prove the game wrong, but the amount of luck that was needed was so ridiculously high. Back on the talk of being unlucky, I swear that I saw literally everything in the book when I played this. I was frozen twice in a row, I landed a total of 3 crits on Houndoom the entire night, and he also had a Gyarados break out of confusion, fall out of love, and then get a crit waterfall on my Absol. I felt like I was slowly becoming the 8th wonder of the world with the amount of terrible luck I had the entire night. After attempting every method under the sun, I ended up giving up for the night because I had been streaming for nearly 7 hours, so I finished the day with a plan to beat him, but I still felt in the back of my head that this might be the end of the run. That being said, it was probably one of the most fun streams I did because we just spent the entire time laughing about how bad my luck was, but nevertheless I decided to hold off until tomorrow to give it a shot with a fresh mind. At the start of the stream, I decided to give in and leave the Distortion World to switch out a member of our team. It was pretty obvious that Abomasnow offered literally nothing to the team as it was weak to nearly everyone, so I caught a new Machoke to help combat Weavile and make things uh, maybe a little bit easier. In the first battle against Cyrus, the battle played out normally with Gastrodon taking down Houndoom before Absol was sent into battle with Gyarados. On the previous day, we figured that using a track turn 1 gives us a much higher chance of landing two thunders because it outspeeds and nearly knocks us out anyways, so we stuck with that plan. It ended up getting immobilized, and I landed Thunder with Paralysis, so I could outspeed the next turn. Naturally, I missed, but thankfully Gyarados was paralyzed that turn, so I could freely land another Thunder to take him down. I chose to send out Machoke next to take on Weavile, and since we didn't really prepare for this, I wasn't sure if Machoke would actually live a move from it, but if it could, we could land a Cross Chop and knock it out because it has the ability No Guard. I completely forgot that it goes for Fake Out turn 1, and it dealt a ton of damage, so I figured that this was going to be a reset, but it was the first attempt, so I just kept going. It landed Ice Punch, and it must have been the worst low roll in the history of Pokemon because I lived on 4 HP, and then I sent Weavile out of the Distortion World with a single Cross Chomp. From here he sends out Crobat, and then switches to Honchkrow so Bronzong's Extra Sensory doesn't land, so I sacrificed Gastrodon for a free switch into Graveler. 
I tried to go for a quick claw explosion, but it didn't go first, but I somehow lived on 2 HP and I was able to knock it out in one hit. To my surprise, Crobat knocked out Bronzong after landing two flinches and healing, so it was up to two nearly dead Pokemon and my Golbat to take care of the last Pokemon. I landed Confuse Ray and went for Fly and ended up snapping out, and I made the risky play of going for Confuse Ray again. It broke out of Confusion and went for Air Slash, but it ended up missing which allowed me to land Fly and take down his whole team. So to make a long story short, I really should have had Machoke and this would have taken about 4 hours less, but like I said, I'm kinda of stubborn and I wanted to see if it was possible with the original team. But that out of the way, we've finished the Galactic storyline. Now that that's all taken care of, the only thing we have left to do here is catch the legendary Pokemon. Giratina is not only the highest level encounter that we can get at this point, but it's also such a great typing with a great moveset that it will obviously be added to the team. Now you're probably assuming that I'm going to use my Master Ball on this Pokemon, but there is one more Pokemon that we can probably serve me better that we can use it on, so I spent about 30 minutes just throwing Pokeballs until I finally caught it. After leaving the Spear Pillar, we're free to head to the 8th gym, but I think it's time to work on collecting the final members of our team. If we head back to Sand Gem Town, we can have a really close conversation with Professor Rowan before being able to head to Lake Verity and go inside the cavern. After locating Mesperit, it will roam around the region, and we have the ability to hunt it down through the marking map on our Pokich. After dashing between routes for a couple minutes, we encounter it, and with the Master Ball, we can add it to the team. Now you're probably thinking this is a weird choice that I chose this Pokemon over the others, and I caught this because I plan to have all of the Lake Spirits on our team by the time we reach the Elite Four. Although they are all the same type and they'll have multiple weaknesses, they're the highest level encounters that we can get aside from surfing on the water, and they can learn an absurd amount of moves to cover any type that I face. After grabbing a ton of Dust Balls, I went to Lake Acuity to catch Yuxi, and Lake Valor to catch Azelf, which gives us an extremely busted team to take on the final gym. Moving forward quite a bit, we reached Sunny Shore City and talked to Volkner at the Lighthouse before taking on the gym. Because our levels are so much higher than earlier, every battle here was so absurdly easy that I knew that Volkner was probably not going to even be a little bit of an issue. I'll admit I was a little cocky because I tried to get an Omni Boost from Ancient Power and Ominous Wind like 7 times in a row, so I ended up losing because I threw with arguably the best Pokemon on my team. On the second attempt, I actually took Jolteon down seriously, and the only Pokemon that was actually difficult was Electivire, but overall this section took basically no effort and I steamrolled through his team to claim the final badge in the Sinnoh region. Now that we're all done with the story elements, it's time to take on the final challenge, the Elite Four. After talking it over with my chat, we decided that a majority of the Pokemon in Victory Road are going to be pretty useless against the Pokemon League, so we decided on one Pokemon that's now available to go along with our team of legends. If we surf around north of the city, we can encounter Tentacruel. Not only is this Pokemon a good mix of being strong and a tank, but it's one of the very few Pokemon you can encounter at level 50 at this point in the game. I used a repel trick to get the encounter, and it surprisingly took only a minute before I was able to add it to the team. From here I surfed through the route and used Waterfall to reach the entrance to Victory Road. Although you're probably expecting that I'm going to have a lot to say here because this is the hardest group of trainers in the region, this was a lot easier than I expected. There was really only one battle, or more so one Pokemon, being the trainer with a Torterra on the second floor by the Strength Puzzle. That was the only one that required a couple attempts to get through, but aside from that my team was able to run through it with no problem. After about 30 minutes I made it to the end of Victory Road and the entrance to the Pokemon League. Now that we only have 6 battles left in the game, I figured now was better than ever to completely build my team for the remainder of the challenge. If you've been paying attention, you might have noticed that I only mentioned 5 Pokemon on our final team, and I planned on the final member being Graveler because explosions helped in so many situations so far in the game. After grabbing that, I spent quite a while going over what the best movesets would be with my chat and collecting items and big TMs. Thankfully during this whole challenge, I saved almost every good TM that I found, so I was able to give my entire team a pretty crazy list of moves, along with some TMs that I purchased again at the Vealstone department store. On the final day of the challenge, I finished off adding the final touches to my team before I was truly ready to face the biggest challenge we've had to take on. The first battle that we have to take care of is against our rival at the entrance. Although his team is really really strong, our Azelf and Tentacruel completely ran through his entire team. Now despite that, this battle took me two tries, but not for the reason that you'd think. So for some reason his Torterra gave me one single experience point, and on the second reset it did the exact same thing. For some reason the higher level Pokemon give out one experience, so technically the run is invalid because I gained literally one experience point. By the end of the day, it's a technical flaw and it doesn't really change my Pokemon statistics until I fight like 20,000 of them, but this does happen a couple more times in the run just so you're aware. After a pretty easy battle, we're ready to take on the Elite Four. The first member is obviously Aaron, and although his bug type team is relatively easy to beat, it's important to remember that I really need to conserve as many power points as possible in order to make our move pool against Cynthia as diverse as we can. Out of all the battles, this is the one that used the most Pokemon on my team, but that was mostly because of what I just mentioned. Azelf did most of the work, but Tentacruel helped finish off the end because Giratina was my only counter and it was knocked out midway through the match. This one still took me two attempts, but that was my own choosing to try again to use different moves. 
Bertha was by far the easiest member of the Elite Four. I gave Mesper a Grass Knot, which nearly one-shot every Pokemon on our team, and for the Pokemon I couldn't cover, Tentacruel and even Graveler were able to make this battle a breeze. There isn't really much to say here except that Gliscor gave me a little trouble at the end, but this battle took a total of 5 minutes to do. Up next is Flynn. His fire team is probably the least diverse team in the building, but there are a ton of heavy hitters like Magmortar and Infernape that can give you a ton of trouble. Tentacruel and Giratina took up a majority of the battle with Hydro Pump and Earthquake, and Azelf was used to take on Infernape as well. Funny enough, the only real issue I had was dealing with Solar Beam, and the sun wasn't even up so it didn't pose a big threat anyways. I'm not really surprised this was also an easy battle because almost every fire type in this game is pure fire, but with him out of the way we only have one member left of the Elite Four. Lucian is our final challenge before the champion and is by far the best built team in the Pokemon League. He always leaves with Mr. Mime and sets up Light Screen and Reflect to help the rest of his team, and because Pokemon like Espeon and Alakazam are really frail, they get a huge advantage on top of dealing a ton of damage. On the first attempt, I lost because of the strategy, so I tried the old classic strat of leading with Graveler and go for a quick claw explosion. I ended up landing that on the first try, which left a majority of his team defenseless. Despite the screens, his team is still absurdly strong, but Azelf's U-turn into Giratina's Shadow Force is just too powerful for the team to stand a chance. I'll admit though, I did get a little lucky with a couple of turns, but overall the Graveler play was definitely the go-to to make this a much smoother fight. Now all we have to do is take on the final challenge. As you've been probably expecting for the entire video, Cynthia is the champion of the Sinnoh region and is easily the hardest opponent in the entire game. Not only is she nearly 10 plus levels over my team across the board, but aside from Rose Raid, she has some of the best Pokemon available in the game. The biggest issue on her team aside from Garchomp is her Spiritomb lead, and that's mostly because we don't have a counter for it, because it doesn't have any in this generation. I decided to set up Light Screen to tank Shadow Ball, and then went for Yawn to put it to sleep so I can set up Reflect as well. After getting knocked out, I switched into Azelf while I was sleeping and went for Nasty Plot to make it as strong as I could with the limited time that I had. My chat told me to go for a double, which was super risky even though the screens were up, but fortunately it slept for another turn and I was at plus 4 with full health. As you can probably expect, not only did I knock out the Spiritomb, but with the combination of Fire Blast, Psychic, and Thunderbolt, I literally swept her entire team with basically only using Azelf. I was laughing literally the entire battle as to how anticlimactic of an ending this match was, but at the same time I was extremely thankful that I was able to put this game to rest. And with that, we've successfully beat Pokemon Platinum with only earning like 17 experience. But how'd I do? So let's review. Although many parts of this challenge were pretty easy, this challenge really required me to think about the game in a completely different way, and I'd be lying if this wasn't one of the most fun challenges I've ever streamed or uploaded to this channel. The concept is so simple, yet it tests you with finding the most creative and unique ways to take on even some of the most simple battles within the Sinnoh region. Overall, I'd really love to try this out for other games, so if you enjoyed this video and want to see me take on other regions, if we can reach 10,000 likes on this video, I'll stream this and work on the video as soon as we reach the goal. Speaking of streaming, if you want to check out some of my challenges being done live like this one, I'll be starting another Nuzlocke on there the day that this video is going up. I usually stream around 4.30 Eastern, and I promise you it's well worth your time. As always, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and let me know what other challenges you'd like me to take on next. Other than that, that's all there is to say about beating Pokemon Platinum without earning any experience in battle. And that's going to do for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as we'll be making more content like this very soon. If you have any other suggestions for videos you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. If you're interested in watching me take on challenges live, I've been streaming a lot over my Twitch account as well as upload highlights on my Johnstone Live channel that you can find in the description. Other than that, like thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.